Good morning. How you guys doing? Awesome. All right. Awesome. So let me figure this out. There we go. Um, we're starting a new series, as you can tell, God's Family. You see the signage here. We had some amazing gifted creatives work on uh, the look of the sign and our background. Uh, we, it's amazing the talent we have at our church. Can we just give a hand for the worship leaders, for the people who do all this stuff? For small church, we put together some amazing things. But we, let me reference a series we did a while back to introduce this series. We, we did a series called The Twelve uh, a number of months ago, which was like the 12 hardest, craziest things Jesus said in the course of his ministry. And we unpack those statements. But one statement we didn't cover that I wish we had, so I'll just take a minute and, and talk about it. It comes from Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. You don't have to turn there. It's not our passage. But Matthew 12, 50, Jesus is teaching a large crowd. He's teaching to a large crowd. And his mother, Mary, and his brothers come to talk to him. The scripture doesn't say why, but they need his attention. And so someone goes to relay that message. They work their way through the crowd to get to Jesus and say, hey, your, your mom and your brothers are outside waiting for you. And then Jesus says this really strange thing. He says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? If it wasn't Jesus, we think that's rude, right? Because he's 30 years old now by this point. He knows who his mommy is and his brothers are. And then what's even stranger is he turns to the crowd he's teaching and he says, uh, here, he points to his disciples, he says, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Again, weird. If you just don't sanitize that, if you don't scrub that and give Jesus the Son of God cred that he, he deserves... On its own, it's a bizarre, shocking statement because what Jesus is saying is that your spiritual family is deeper and more ultimate than your blood family. He's saying there's something about the spiritual family that runs deeper and lasts longer, i.e. forever, in contrast to your earthly family. The Holy Spirit ties you closer than blood. In other words, you have more in common with a Christian in Mongolia than you do with an unbelieving cousin. Now let that kind of sink in for a little. If I had a mic, I'd drop it right there. <laughs> That's an insane thing to ponder. And I'm not saying it Jesus is. You can take it up with him if you disagree. But that's how much Jesus values spiritual family. That's from Jesus' mouth. Now, Jesus' family looks a certain way. My family looks like this. This is my family. We're all Asian because my wife is Korean. I'm Korean. Therefore, we produce Korean kids. This is my tribe. A little bit of education there for you. That's how it works. But God's family looks like this. Hello, Sharif. Now, and that's represented here. Now, a while back, there was a commercial, a Cheerios commercial that cost some uproar. You guys remember this? It was an interracial family, a beautiful mixed, do a mixed girl. I don't know who could hate on this family. But it caused all this uproar because there was this interracial thing on TV. And there's all these voices saying that should not happen. And sadly to say, I know some of those voices come from the church, which, again, disturbs me because God's family looks like this. When the early church started and the Holy Spirit dropped on Jerusalem, and Peter preached his sermon. 2,000 people get saved. Those 2,000s were Jews and Greeks, free, slave, women, men, children, barbarians. They had to figure this out day one because their church looked like that. Not my family. It looked like that. And so they had to figure out what it means to be a diverse church from the get-go. In fact, when the church started, it was the most diverse community the world had ever seen, period. Period. And it wasn't just like diversity like uh, you see among um, certain trends. Like you, you can see, you can walk into like a hipster coffee bar and see all kinds of hipsters. Different, different kinds of facial hair, different skinniness in their jeans, 
different varieties of overpriced coffee, but they gather around certain trends, right? Or like the iPhone 7's released, and so if you look at the line that, that, that camped out in front of the store, you'll find all kinds of people because the gadget brought them together. Or at a club, you'll see people dancing because they're grooving to a music together. But that's not the diversity we're talking about because this is diversity among enemies, among Jew and Gentile, among slave and free. Let me kind of put it in today's language, like a Trump supporter and a Black Lives Matter supporter. We're talking about that kind of diversity that makes your head spin. What, what kind of family is this going to be? And yet, this is the family Jesus chooses because against the backdrop of that context, the fibers of agape love becomes very apparent. When you have people all look alike and sound alike and they get together and do family, it's like, all right, that's, that makes sense. But when enemies get together, people who have no business being together get together and they don't just tolerate they don't just gather around music and food, but they love each other like family, then the world takes notice. And that was the early church. The gospel saved people, but the gospel preached in the context of a true supernatural family is what convinced people God is for real. And I declare over this church, and we'll always preach the gospel, you can just assume that, but I declare over this church, when we become genuine family, and that's our destiny, that's our calling, we have something to contribute to this city. This city, like all cities, torn apart by tribes. And we'll talk about what those tribes mean. If they see a supernatural family, and we have one here, where we don't just sit next to each other, but we're family, man, we have a message to give to this city. Now, I want to talk today about all that prevents us from being family. It's a five-week series called God's Family, and today's the first one. And I want to start from a very honest place. What prevents us from being this kind of family? Because there's a lot that has to happen for us to be family. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm supposed to love you. Turn to the other neighbor and say, it's not going to be easy. <laughs> and that is... The truth. That's the truth, because the Bible says, especially in the passage we're going to read, that what characterizes us are walls. So look at Ephesians 2. Uh, my sermon will break into two parts, life before the church, which is the wall of hostility, and life after the church, which is I call wall-busting reconciliation, and then a few reflections for us as a church. So Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. Um, Therefore... Ephesians 2.11, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God um, through the cross, through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And that is the word of God. So, life before the church, the wall of hostility. Paul points to a wall, and this wall is not just metaphor, it really existed. Back in the ancient days when the temple still stood, there was a wall, a stone wall, that barricaded the Gentiles from getting any closer than the outer courts. This wall was thick and high, and in intervals were signs hanging that trespassers, i.e. Uh, Gentiles, will be executed if they step one inch farther. And Paul points to this wall as a symbol of how we operate before the church. We were alienated. We were divided. We were separated. And that starts as early as three years old. My daughter, second daughter Hope, sweet little Hope, 
comes to me one day. She's three years old. She says, um, Daddy, I like Sally, but I dislike Mary. And I ask her why. And she, and she says, because Mary has long hair and Sally has short hair. Right? In her mind, that makes sense. But already she's categorizing children by their hair length. My other daughter, Amanda, my firstborn, when she was three, there's something about three where depravity sets in, okay? It's when they begin to spoil and rot. Well, she comes to me, oh no, I, I overhear her introducing her friend uh, Maria to someone else, and she goes, uh, Mrs. Maria, um, she's Spanish, I'm human, okay? And I'm like, no, don't say that. Now, obviously, she's three, she's not trying to be racist. She notices a difference but doesn't have the vocabulary to say it properly, okay? But the lesson here is that she is categorizing. Like, she notices differences, and, and she's one way and someone else is the other way. But we all have that instinct. It's inborn, where we begin to categorize people based on race, ethnicity, personality, uh, their job, their, their, their wealth, their portfolios, uh, even hair length for my, for my three-year-old daughter. And it's hard to love people even when you're in the same camp. Even when you all look alike and you all share the same values, it's, it's hard to love people even within your own family. But how about people who are across the lines, across the dividing wall? The basic credo of humanity when it comes to relationships is love who you want to love, hate who you want to hate. Love who you want to love, hate who you want to hate. And Paul says that this is the tragic story of people before church. You, pick your, you put your finger anywhere in a human civ, uh, world civ textbook, and you'll find war, you'll find bloodshed, you'll find cycles of violence, because this is what defines us. We are tribal by nature. We love who we want to love. We hate who we want to hate. And it's not just world civ and history. It's today's headlines. And you, all, you and I have lived in the same world over the last Six months, we've seen all kinds of things break out all over the world. And that's today. Nothing's changed. So Paul points to this divide between Jew and Gentile to say this represents humanity. The divide between Jew and Gentile and separated by dividing wall of hostility. This is us. And he points to that example because uh, if, if we have cracks between black, white, Asian, black, or whatever combination, uh, the divide between Jew and Gentile is the Grand Canyon. It's the sharpest and longest disagreement and divide in the history of humanity, thousands, reaching back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is the Grand Canyon. It was written by um, a, uh, a scholar. Jews believe that Gentiles were created by God to be the fuel for the fires of hell. This is back in the day. It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile mother in her hour of sorest need, for that would simply be to bring another Gentile into the world. Until Christ came, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews. The barrier between them was absolute. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, or if a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out, for such contact with the Gentile was the equivalent of death. Jews couldn't even touch what Gentiles touched, lest they, get, lest they get contaminated. How did it get that way? That wasn't God's plan for the Jews. He chose them, but he chose them to be missionaries to the world. He said, I'm going to bring you in close and expose you and give you privileged access, but you're to take that access and spread that to the world. But they took their election and made it exclusive, and they made God a tribal God. And over the course of history, when you have a, a tribe that says, we are loved by God, you're not, you're going to get oppressed and persecuted. And they were horribly by their Gentile neighbors. And so over the thousands of years, Jews learned to hate Gentiles and consider them as rejects of God. And likewise, Gentiles learned to hate the Jews. And that's been going on to this day. If you look at the Palestinian and Israeli divide, that is something that's been happening for thousands of years. It makes the, the differences we have look like nothing compared to that problem. And so when you look at that, Paul says this, this divide between Jew and Gentile is just the symptom of what we all face as people, this problem of alienation, this problem of 
division. And let me throw up on the board, in case you think it's just an ancient problem. Uh, no, one before that. Okay, next. <laughs> next one. Oh, okay, it didn't make it. Next one. There we go. All right, perfect. Perfect. Okay. I've got a Nazi soldier and a Holocaust survivor. I've got Ku Klux Klan and Malcolm X. I've got Hutu and Tutsi, Janjaweed and, I don't know my history, African farmer, and Al-Qaeda soldier, and an Israeli. Right here are millions and millions of slain bodies, genocide, incredible bitterness. What do you say to address this table if they were seated around a theoretical table? What would you say to address their issues? Get along. Be nice. Be polite. Do you understand that this is the human condition? This is the infection that we live with? And just in case you think, well, they're genocidal maniacs. Listen, Monday morning when I'm on the road and someone cuts me off, or there's too many cars on the street. I want a divine hand just to sweep them off the road and make them vanish. I don't care who they are, whether they're parents or children, I want them off the face of the earth. <laughs> or if I'm at a grocery line and I go to the self-checkout area and there's a lady who doesn't know how to do produce, she's struggling and causing me to be late, I literally want to just shove her down the lane. I just move along. Go back around to a, a checkout line because this is for people who know how to do this. <laughs> There's murderous intent in all of us. We just don't have the levers to pull. Or think about the times you're inconvenienced or delayed or wounded by someone who looks different and smells different. Then it becomes even darker. I read a blog of someone who was at the KFC, uh, an Asian woman, one of my friends actually, and she was waiting in a long line. It was just, you know, maybe it was after hours, one person at the checkout area or the line. Uh, an older white man walks in and walks straight to the register and starts to order. And she says, uh, sir, the, the line starts way over here. And he turns to her and says, why don't you go back to your own country and eat? And she writes about, what should I have done? I know what I would have done. And I'd say, I'm the pastor of Mosaic after I do it. <laughs> uh, I know what I've done. I know what I would have done. And as a part of me in anger, I, I want to line up all racists and shoot them. That's where I come from. But here's the thing. I would have to get shot too. Because though I might not verbalize or act on my thoughts, I've had the thoughts. Why are you so backwards? Why aren't you more American? Why don't you speak the language better? Why this? Why that? Why do you have these attributes? It's all kinds of sordid, messed up, racist thoughts in my head. And I know all of you, if you're human, have struggled with one version of that or another. Because this is not a, a historical issue. It's a heart issue. It runs through all of us. And so Paul points to the Jew-Gentile divide, not to give you a history lesson, but to say that divide runs right through us. Before the church, we are tribal, and our motto is love who we want to love, hate who we want to hate, and there is no power on earth that can stop that as evidenced by history and today's headlines. Does that make sense? All right. Now let's get back to the birth of the church. Uh, point two, birth of the church, wall-busting reconciliation. In verse 13, everything begins to change. Paul says that in Jesus Christ, and specifically through his blood, we who were once far and alienated are now brought near. Verse 14 says, not only are we brought near, but we're brought in and fused together with the Jews to become one people. Now, it sounds like theological jargon. Just understand this. What, what Paul is saying is that the church begins by taking the two worst enemies in human history and not just having them sit together and eat, but to become one people, a family, brother and sister, mother and father. And that is a breathtaking, supernatural work of reconciliation. This, my friends, 
is the birth of the church. It's not similar people getting together to eat kosher food and sing kumbaya. It is enemies. Enemies. It talks about in the Bible how uh, when the Jews were being savaged by the Babylonians or the Assyrians, they would rip babies out of pregnant mothers and slam them to the ground. This is in their collective memory. They had to be family with the people that used to kill them. And so this is the birth of the church. It comes through supernatural reconciliation. Paul later calls it the manifold genius of God. The manifold wisdom of God is the church. It's something the angels didn't expect and the devil certainly did not see. That somehow through the cross, he would give birth to a family that looks like that. Jew and Gentile becoming one. To become one new humanity, Paul writes, where it's multilingual, multicolored, both genders, multi-generational. This is how God's family is supposed to look. And the question is, how? Because it won't be by being more cordial and more polite, more thank yous and more hellos. That might work well in a subway tunnel to just you know, get humanity moving along, but it certainly won't make anyone family. It's not strong enough to deal with indifference and bitterness and racism. You need something much stronger to destroy the wall of hostility. And Paul says that is Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. How? It says specifically by the cross. That Jesus breaks his body to break the wall. He breaks his body to break the wall. It's the cross of Jesus. Now, rather than preach the finer points of theology about the cross, which I'm sure I'll do in later sermons, I want you to hear a story. So if you can cue the video, there's a video um, of a sister named Maribel. This is back 15 years ago um, that I saw this video. So forgive the video quality. It's a lot of flowers. Just forgive the, forget the flowers. Zero in on her story. Listen to her story of how the cross brings reconciliation. I'd often wonder if I was a miracle or a mistake. Born premature at seven months to a mother who was not supposed to be able to conceive, I was meant to be a miracle. But my father made it be known that I was a mistake by leaving my mother the day I was born. My mother must have known that as well as she abandoned me and gave chase to get my father back. As a little girl, my hair was cut to look like a boy in order to cross the border and rejoin my mother, only to be used as a pawn to get her husband back home. However, his return meant dark nights of drunkenness, of him molesting me. At the age of seven, I stabbed myself with a chart of glass from a broken mirror, but death wouldn't take me. My teenage years, drugs, raves, and sex, I became what they called a Lolita. And when my mother found out, she said, Está bien, no hay nada malo con eso. At 18, I married a man who could take care of me but didn't. Newport Beach, Bolts, Porsches, and Rolex. I had everything and yet nothing. My husband rejected our unborn babies. He rejected me and left. I was the living dead. Darkness prevailed. My life reeked of the stench of stagnant water. But then I met a man who loved me for me. My savior, I thought. Our daughter was born. We got married, had two sons. But my wounds began to surface. And I became controlling, abusive, neglectful. I lost my love for my husband and my children. To make matters worse, I had to care for my dying mother, who never knew how to care for me. In her last days, I bitterly told her, No se vaya sin pedirme perdón. On her deathbed, my mother gave her life to Jesus. My bitterness only intensified. Now she was forgiven and saved? How could it be? This was unfair, unjust. This shattered my fragile marriage into a million pieces. 
Every day I doused my longing for death with alcohol. Until one day a light pierced the darkness. A simple invitation to church from a friend. The pastor offered to pray for those with heavy burdens. I raised my hand and Jesus met me, embraced me, loved me. A new life began. I was no longer in darkness. Each day was filled with wonder, beauty. My husband saw a change in me. He wanted what I had. Jesus met him too. Our marriage was restored. I found peace knowing I'll see my mother again. What I had seen as unfair and unjust, I now see as a miracle. But an even greater miracle was to come. My father, the one who hurt me, the one who violated me, the one who saw me as a mistake. As I stood outside the door in Mexico, my heart was filled with fear, but perfect love cast out fear. Exemplified in Jesus' love for me and in the forgiveness of what I thought unforgivable. So with that, I opened my mouth. Papá, lo perdono y lo quiero. Lo quiero porque Jesús me ama a mí. At that moment, my father experienced the love of Christ. Tears flowed as we prayed, and what was once seen as a mistake became a miracle. So I hope what you picked up was what empowered Maribel's capacity to forgive a father who abandoned her and molested her and abused her was the love of Jesus. Because Jesus forgave me and loved me, I can forgive and love who was once my enemy. The cross is the only means by which the oppressor and the oppressed can stand on the same ground and embrace. Because the cross is the only power that can convict a monster like her father and have him repent and change. And the cross is the only power that promises redemption and renewal and healing for those who've been oppressed. That if Jesus can die and resurrect, there is hope for the scars and the wounds that the enemies have gouged in us. And therefore, the cross is the only place where it can bring conviction to the oppressor and healing to the oppressed and have them come together and experience forgiveness and wholeness. Only Jesus. No other power in society, no amount of education, no political policy can bring about reconciliation but the cross of Jesus. Do you agree? Amen. If you think about the way Jesus is nailed to the cross, and nothing is by mistake, his arms are open wide to a world that just murdered him. That's his posture. And we, as his followers, have been given this capacity that though you've been wounded, you open up your arms and you embrace. Though you have been an oppressor and a wounder, you're brought to conviction to do this to those you've hurt. Only the cross can do that. I think about one um, a missions conference called Urbana. How many university students are here? Okay, a handful, more than a handful, good. Um, once every three years, they have this global missions conference where thousands of students gather. And there was a Japanese delegation, Japanese college students from Japan, who approached the Korean delegation. And they began to weep and confess their sins as a nation. Now, you have to understand the backdrop to this story, is that during World War II and maybe even before that, uh, Japan occupied Korea and committed horrible war crimes against our people. And because of that, Koreans learned to hate the Japanese. It's part of the story of these two countries. Even though way back they were actually the same people. It, all this stuff happened, and there's all this hatred. And so these Japanese students were so convicted by the gospel, they went, and before these Korean students... They repented. Of, it's called identity repentance, and that's a, there's a biblical precedent for that where the Jews would repent for the sins of their fathers. And so these students are repenting for the sins of their fathers. And you see the Korean students melting and weeping to hear that, and they embrace. That right there is church. 
when enemies reconcile, when Jew and Gentile become family, when Maribel and her dad become family, when Koreans and Japanese become family, when white, black, Asian, black, white, brown, all the combinations, regardless, there's too many. Church is a miraculous place where enemies become family because of the cross. And the cross is no respecter of division. Where there is two, the cross compels us to become one. The last thing, reflections. This brings me to a couple thoughts about our church. I know we have this cross right here. It so represents us. It's kind of banged up. It's kind of uh, interesting looking. It's not normal. All right? It's a hipster cross. I love it. Um, That should be hanging over the threshold of our door. Because when we walk into this church, you don't walk in as strangers and, God forbid, as enemies. You walk in as reconciled brothers and sisters because of what Jesus has done. And so when we walk into this church, I want to make it clear for all of us that no wall will be left standing. Now, I'm not saying we're a perfect community. We're in process. But that's our standard. Where there is a wall of division, we are knocking that thing down. Because Jesus says he has destroyed the wall of hostility. Where there is division, we want unity. Where there's hostility, we want peace. Where there's bitterness, we want forgiveness. That will be who we are at this church. But to do that, we need to get honest. And we need to repent for the sins of racism, bigotry, bitterness that all of us carry. So do with me, uh, do this for a moment. Uh, I want to throw a slide up here and look at these faces. Just take a look and just have an open mind and, and, and see what thoughts come to mind as you look at each face, as you scan them. Take a look at each one for a few seconds and see what you feel. Next slide. I submit to you that some of these faces will draw you in, like, oh, cool, I could be friends with that person. I could be family. Some of these faces are like, eh, I'll steer, I'll steer clear. Not sure if we can do anything together. Who are you drawn to at this church or just in life? Who are you naturally attracted to? Who do you lean into and lean away from? Now, color and ethnicity is an easy way to chop it up. But how about between married and single? Children, no children. Here's a big one extroverted, introverted. I've noticed loud people like loud people and quiet people like quiet people. And sometimes there's a quiet and loud mix that works, but I've seen personality drive us apart. Graduate degree, GED. Charismatic, non-charismatic. Older, younger, socially awkward, popular, pretty, plain. That's subjective, obviously. Uh, Republican, it's a big one. Democrat, Can we start from an honest place? What deep-seated sins of bigotry and racism and arrogance and bitterness and cliquishness must we repent of? Because when you walk through these doors, you walk through the cross of Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to take the family of God seriously, we must begin with repentance. And I say that intentionally because I, I submit to you humbly that the problems we face as a people is not a policy issue. It's not a political issue. And it's not a sociological issue. It's not an educational issue. It's not to say those things don't touch the issue, but at the heart of it is a heart issue. It's a sin issue. Let me submit this to you. We can never fix racism. It's been 5,000 years. We can repent of racism. Can't fix it. We cannot fix human nature. We can only repent of it and have Jesus fix it. Jesus can give us a heart transplant because that's what we need to take up the ugly heart, the sinful heart, and put in a sanctified heart. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't affect sociology and politics. Those are all important things, but it begins here because without this changing, none of that matters. None of that matters because law, policy, education cannot change this right here, deep things. 
And so as a community here, the most urgent thing we can do is to get right with God and get right with each other. The 200 plus people of beautifully diverse in age. Listen, this is the most diverse church I've ever been a part of. And maybe it's the same for you. We have a laboratory right here. We can do it right here. But it begins with repentance. And so if I can have some help here, I want to do a corporate act of repentance. We've got this beautiful sign that's going to be brought to the, to the floor here. God's family with the colors, um, intentionally diverse. Um, our sister Anna, where's Anna? There she is. She actually painted this. Give her a hand. This is our um, destiny. This is what we're working for for the next however many years we are as a church. We'll always be working on this till we get to heaven. We are family. And we'll experience deeper and deeper levels of this where the colors come together in unity. But this is not where we're starting from. We're starting from a very different place, if we're honest. And so here's what I want you to do. As a corporate act of repentance, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, I want you to think of a wall that you have put up. Bitterness, envy, whatever. Whatever brick of the wall you've contributed that's brought division in your life. I want you, as the Spirit convicts you, to come up and write the name of that thing on um, sheets of paper we'll have up here. It, you could write bitterness, you could write racism, you could keep it as vague or as specific as you want. And as the worship team sings over us, you're going to come and as an act of repentance, you're going to pin that to this beautiful sign. Now you're thinking, well, that will make the sign ugly. We're not going to see certain letters, but that's the point. Right now, our destiny is obscured by our sins and by our collective problems. But over the next four weeks, we'll begin to peel those things off until at the end of the series, we will see this sign again to remind ourselves this is where we're headed. 